Please demolish the woman, the woman, they hurt their family members. Next. Entire village remained closed and isolated during uh, cotton operations launched by Indian Army for days, which really affects routine work of the residents. During these uh, operations, they destroy the property of the Kashmiris and uh, they also um, carry out the fake encounters and during all those encounters, they also um, destroy the property of the armless Kashmiris. This is uh, one of an example where a house is set ablaze by Indian security forces during an encounter. Here you can see that entire building is destroyed by Indian forces and residents are homeless and they are not paid any kind of compensation. Presently it is also seen that there are use of highly sophisticated weapons and high explosives as residential areas to destroy those houses and properties of the innocent Kashmiris. This is one of the condition of one of the encounter site at South Kashmir. And here you can see the debris of the uh, houses and the buildings where the encounter uh, was um, taken place. Next. This is a house of Molana Iltaf Hussein Nadwi and it is seen that Indian, uh, Indian army they raided and they ransacked the residence uh, of the religious scholar. Next. Uh, not only the human beings, but animals are also victims of Indian atrocities in Kashmir. Here you can see a nomad la lady who almost breaks down on the dead body of one of the horses killed by Indian army. When protests take place, journalists and protesters, they are really distinguished. They, they are um, indiscriminately victim of the Indian atrocities. Curfews restru restrictions next. Uh, during curf curfew restrictions, a complete shutter down takes place, and there is uh, there are no schools, markets are closed, education of student um, is not does not take place. Next, next, next. Okay, this use of tear gases and um, on the peaceful protesters. Can you please? Yes. This is a story of a, a Kashmiri youth who's, uh, who was killed after a tear gas canister was hit to him. There was no protest going on, but even then Indian army, they threw tear gas at him and they killed the youth. This is Funeral of Iltaf Fayaz Wani, who is victim of Tegas shell. He was not involved in any stone pelting. He was not involved in any protest. He just went to attend a marriage with his family where a tear gas shell hit him and he was killed. Next. The Hurriyat leaders, they are being arrested during peaceful protests. Uh, the women, uh, Hurriyat leaders, they are detained and presently we have uh, seen some pictures of the Hurriyat leaders that they are detained and they are badly tortured and even it is, uh, it is known that they are uh, forced to eat the, Indian, uh, the animal waste and drink uh, animal urine in the uh, jails. Next. 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 Okay. Um, here I'm going to uh, talk in um, some detail about militancy of militancy in Kashmir. I'm going to speak in context of international law that how inter militancy is recognized by international law and how it justifies the peaceful resistance and armed struggle going on in Kashmir. The international law recognizes and justifies resistance and armed struggle against colonial occupying forces. In fact, any such struggle by definition has a full-blooded support and sanction of international law. It naturally follows that in accordance with international 
law elsewhere the world walls of national liberation have been embraced as an instrument of protection as an essential right of occupied people as advised by additional protocol in the geneva convention of 1949 ladies and gentlemen kashmir remains as one of the most highly militarized zone in the world with the highest number of military bases a series of bilateral talks have failed to resolve the issue a un ceasefire and existence of un commission of india and pakistan uncip have not helped to address the people concern and to enfranchise them in a situation where even right to protest peacefully has been ceased peaceful campaigns for freedom were curbed with brutal force a group of kashmiris they resorted to armed struggle to end indian occupation ladies and gentlemen in kashmir international law recognizes the fundamental rights to self determination freedom and independence for the occupied in kashmir that includes the right of armed struggle if necessary ladies and gentlemen india is involved in attempting to militarily obliterate the people with valid self determination claims to the to reduce these conflicts to terrorism the defenders of self determination are in a very vulnerable position charged with terrorism the defenders of the group fighting for the realization of national liberation are also being labeled are unduly burdened by laws against terrorism at extremely serious expense are not only human rights but human under geneva convention other treaties and customary laws of armed in the conflict ladies and gentlemen india controls a straight machinery including the administration the judiciary and the police as well as the modern means of communication and modern army equipped with powerful and sophisticated weapons the other is composed of less than 100 irregular combatants where only asset is their high motivation and strong faith and the and the justice for their cause reflecting popular aspirations which cannot be freely and democratically expressed and persuaded here i have chosen few of the minor militants those who have chosen militancy to end indian occupation ladies and gentlemen it is very pertinent to uh, note over here that who gave this this path to join militancy shown in the screen are four minor militants from from age of 19 14 to 19 age next here you can see the children of kashmir with gun and they are motivated towards militancy next this is 16 year old militant adil and fazan they have been martyred by indian forces they were only 16 years old this is also important to note over here that scholars doctors and engineers they are becoming militants next he is religious scholar commander yasin yatu shaheed he okay next next irshad ahmed shef shaheed he is phd student from shofian kashmir next He is B.Tech graduate from Shofian Irfan Sheikh Shahid. Next, next. Engineering students are also turning towards militancy. Next, Riaz Neku. He is an active militant commander and he is a graduate. Next. Okay, this is an interesting story of an Isaac Pare. Oh, he is also known as Is Isaac Newton. He was famous for sheer academic brilliance and for being an exceptionally intelligent boy. One day after he went missing, he joined militancy. He was talking about rising presence of forces, about regular harassment forced by young boys at the hands of police and army, the mukhbis, militants, and Burhan Wadi. And he was extremely exceptional at his studies. At his 10th standard, he got 98 percent marks. and at his 12th standard he got 10 per, uh, 85% marks okay next next 
These are also some of the stories of the militants who are um, teenagers and they have joined uh, militancy. Next, 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 next. Okay, uh, this is a story of a Nepali boy who has, uh, who is from Nepal, but he wants to become a Muslim and, wo and want to join militancy to, end, to crush the uh, Indian forces and their um, illegal occupation in Kashmir. Next, next. Okay, next I have included some pellet victims, guns, yeah, illegal use of pellet guns, but since uh, uh, my time is over and our um, respected sir has already discussed in detail, so I'll be concluding. I'll be concluding by these words that India is trying to connect the movement with terrorism. The Kashmiri society has embraced this movement and every section of society has played a vital role in furthering glorious cause of freedom. It is not the class war or communal religious conflict, but a movement for right of self-determination. The present struggle owns its birth to the sacred bloods of Kashmiris and hopefully it will reach its destination with Almighty Allah. Voices of Kashmiris won't be silenced lest they forget lest they forgive. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Ms. Atiya Anwar Zon. Ms. Atiya Anwar Zon is working as assistant professor and head of English department in Federal Urdu University Islamabad and PhD scholar in Namal. She is a social activist by Payan and has around 13 years of experience of working on women's rights and gender issues on national and international platforms. Mizon has been actively advocating for the social, political, and economic empowerment in AJK. Her key research areas are focused on gender, conflict resolution, and peace building. She has recently awarded first ever gender-based study analyzing the impact of conflict on women living along the line of control. I request to Ms. Satya Zon kindly come to the podium and express her views. And I also request to the speakers kindly bear the timing in their minds while presenting their papers. Thank you. Honorable Chief Guest, respected panelists, and my dear audience, Aslam Alaikum. I would not go uh, into the statistics because enough of statistics have been shared since morning and I would like to keep my uh, speech focused on the theme, the suffering and resilience of women in Kashmir. Dear audience, we are living in 21st century when world is talking about equality gender equality, where world is talking about 50-50 parliaments, representation of women in parliaments, where world is talking about right to education, where world is talking about right to safety, and where world is talking about United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325, the role of women in peace and security. The United Nations Security Council Resolution 1350, the role of youth in peace and security. And just imagine the women of Kashmir, just imagine the pain and trauma of a mother whose son is disappeared since years and who has no news about the whereabouts of her son. Just imagine the trauma of a half-widow whose husband has disappeared and she does not have any information about either the father of her children and the guarantor of her social security. And just imagine the state of the emotional and psychological trauma of a female who is every day living in a social setup 
which is occupied by these army personnel everywhere. 700,000 troops. So on every seven persons, there is one army personnel. As a female living in Islamabad, that is capital of this country, at times even I face feel insecure because of the social setup that we have to go through. And just I can I can just I cannot imagine the state of those women. How would they be dealing with their everyday lives in the presence of all these army personnel all around? It's really hard to imagine. The women in Kashmir have a long history of suffering, but it's not just the suffering, it's accompanied by their history of resilience. This decades-long conflict has impacted women both directly and indirectly. There has been a lot of mention about half-widows, and it's a term that is specially coined for Kashmiri women, wives of those who have disappeared. And according to authentic record, the number of these disappeared persons is 8,000 plus. So, thousands of half-widows. And just see the social stigmatization because in our society we are living in a patriarchal society and in this south asian societies are patriarchal in a patriarchal societies it's the man who is the guarantor of a woman's social security so she is at the mercy of nobody we have our own religious compulsions she is a half widow because the whereabouts of her husband are not declared and she cannot even remarry according to the religious compulsions. But just look at the more painful aspect. When it comes to marriage, she is considered to be wife of the one who is disappeared. But when it comes to property rights, she is considered a widow. She does not have that access to the property rights. So she is in a very complicated kind of trauma. Just talk about, there has been a lot of mention about rape as weapon of war. And it's not just rape. There are horrible and horrendous incidents of gang rapes complete villages being gang raped and people in Indian occupied Kashmir there's a, there's a most often quoted gang rape is Kunan Poshpura and the people even if now after more than two decades people who belong to these two villages they would not tell that they come from that villages. That is the level of stigma. That is the level of trauma that they do not want to be identified as belonging to so and so area which is famous for a gang rape. These are the just the general social public. But what about those women who were the direct victims of that gang rape? Is it a one-time thing? Is it a one-time tragedy that happens and it's over? I think this travels through generations because it's a psychological trauma. And this trauma, because mother, if a mother carries an emotional and psychological trauma, that burden is transferred to generations. It's not just that woman. It's everybody around that woman. And if we come to the recent incidents, summer 2016, 
marks a new phase in this whole freedom struggle of Kashmiris living in Indian occupied Kashmir. It's a new wave of freedom struggle. And we hear about hundreds of pallet victims who have been blinded in the face of this brutality. What about that teenager girl, Insha, who has been victim of pellet gun, who has been blinded, who has hardly started her life? How is she going to deal with this trauma? And hundreds of other youths who are through the same kind of suffering as hers. The recent incidents of bread chopping and its associated emotional terror, I would say, because for a woman, there are certain aspects of her personality which symbolize her honor. And it's not as simple as it seems in the face of it, bread chopping. No, it carries a heavy load of that victimization, that terror that they have to go through. And I would like to draw your attention to one most ignored segment of women who do not figure when we talk about human rights violations. Because International Universal Declaration of Human Rights in its Article 3 says, everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of a person. What about those women who are living on line of control, both sides of line of control, and bearing the direct brunt of this conflict every day? Do we talk about them? how they are suffering in the hands of this conflict, what kind of challenges they are faced with. The world is talking about women taking charge of the transformation. But here we are talking about women who are still lost in victimization, who are still lost in challenges where they are not sure about their basic life security. What to talk about taking charge and playing some role in peace and security? So I think as a person who is actively engaged with on social and political participation of women, I would like to raise one concern from this podium that if we want to realize our responsibility concerning the women who are living in Indian occupied Kashmir. We will have to empower our women here in AJK so that they are in a position to speak up and advocate for the rights of women living in Indian occupied Kashmir. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Satya Anwar. I'm happy.